Welcome, welcome again. Um, I just wanted to provide a few, a little bit of context for the New City Arts Fellowship. Um, this fellowship at Welcome Gallery supports five Charlottesville area artists um, this spring. And um, every artist is working on projects related to the theme Meantime, uh, written by Tori Cherry. Each artist receives one month in 2022 to transform Welcome Gallery into their studio space. They receive an honorarium, a stocked pantry with their favorite snacks. And um, each fellowship concludes with a two-day exhibition. So Jess's exhibition to open last night and is on view today uh, in the gallery. This program was piloted last year in 2021 and Jess is this year's first artist fellow. Um, you can learn more about these artists and their fellowship projects through a link I will provide in the chat in a moment. Um, and I wanted to thank um, the Charlottesville Area Community Foundation for an Enriching Communities Grant to support this fellowship as well as Maurice Wallace and Pam Sutton Wallace. During today's talk, we ask that you be respectful to other attendees and presenters at all times. Questions or comments that are intentionally harmful, discriminatory, or include hate speech will not be tolerated. Um, if there is any sort of glitch in the event, if the event shuts down, just keep an eye on your email. We'll send instructions on how to rejoin if that happens. Um, and now I am going to introduce Jess. I wanted to thank Letty Naslu for being here today and being our interpreter. Um, welcome, Letty. Um, okay, Jess, I'm going to introduce Jess and then hand things over. Jess Walters is a 31-year-old independent scholar, disability justice advocate, an emerging multimedia artist and documentary producer from Charlottesville, Virginia. She holds a BA in psychology from the University of Virginia and works to address structural inequities and social stigmatizations around disability, neurodivergence, deafness, and chronic kidney disease. As an autistic deaf person who thinks in pictures, Jess has a profound love for playing with words, gestures, and languages to creatively articulate that which they find otherwise ineffable. Through writing, collage, sculpture, photography, and other tangible forms of media, Jess utilizes artistic practices and medicinal opportunities for individual and communal reverence, a vital aspect of personal recovery. She is a member of the Feminist Union of Charlottesville Creatives and a contributing author to the quarterly zine Malo Leche. Their work has been exhibited at Second Street Gallery and Studio X, and this fellowship exhibi exhibition is their first solo exhibition. Um, congrats, Jess, on a success, successful opening last night. Um, and I'm gonna hand things over to you. For, uh, continue to think of questions, by the way, while Jess talks, we're gonna have a time for discussion and Q&A at the end. All right, friends, uh, can everybody hear me okay? Great. Uh, thank you so much for being here today. Um, like Maureen said, my name is Jess Walters. I'm an artist here in Charlottesville. I'm gonna start with a visual description of myself. Um, I am a white person with uh, curly brown hair. I'm currently wearing uh, pink glasses and uh, a shirt that is very colorful and covered in stars and zodiac figures. And uh, I have a great background behind me. Um, I really appreciate every single person who is sharing this space with me today. Uh, and for coming to my exhibit and asking questions. I'm really overwhelmed with the support of my community. Uh, I'm gonna try to get through this without being super emotional, but um, I'm gonna share my screen with you all now and um, just share some pictures of the exhibit so I can't see any of you, which makes this a lot easier for me. Um, so my show is called Delights and Disparities, a spectrum of life in, lived in the meantime. and I came up with this title um, inspired by Tori Cherry, actually, in her description of the uh, call to action to respond to Meantime. It made me reflect a lot on what I did when I didn't have anything to do, um, because when your kidneys fail, your body slowly dies and all of your plans go out the window. And um, it turns out that when I had nothing to do, when all of my plans went out the window, I found a lot to do. Um, a lot of really important things to do that I took for granted as being not so important before. And um, I start here. Uh, I've been a model in the Charlottesville community since 
Um, I think late 2016, I started working with artists like Robert Bricker and Gene Sampson and Sam Fisher and McGuffey as just one of their regular artists. I came to know a lot of them very well. Um, this picture is very special to me. Um, it was drawn by Gene Sampson. And uh, even though these figures were not actually physically present in this space, they felt present. Um, what happened here was I actually fell asleep while posing um, because when your kidneys are sick, you sleep a lot, um, like a lot, yes. like most of the day. Yes. Jess, we can't see your screen. Oh no. That's okay. Will you, um, uh, there we go. Wait, I think I did it. Is that it? Do you see it now? It is. It's coming up yes. for me. It's a little bit slow. It's slow. Is it a picture mm -hmm. of, uh, not seeing a picture, but it says Jess Walter has started screen sharing. Okay, where? Needlessly made, made a minute. for the technical glitches. Let me see if I can open this. And a few slideshow. Is this happening now? I can see it, yep. Yeah, yes, okay. No, yeah. So the title of the piece that I was just describing to you is uh, Dreams I Had While Dying. It is a pencil drawing by Gene Sampson uh, in McGuffey Studio. Um, and I, I started this show with images that other people have taken of me or taken with me throughout this process that I was going on dialysis and transplant because when all this happened to me, I didn't have access to resources. like. My nephrologist told me my kidneys were failing and I went online and tried to find what does that look like? Uh, what is dialysis? Um, what do people look like when they have a port in their stomach? You know, what's the difference between peritoneal dialysis and hemodialysis? And I didn't have answers, so I made some. Um, and this is kind of what that introductory space looks like. Um, this is an actual peritoneal dialysis setup. Um, and the images that are in the background are actually the logs that I took every single day when I did dialysis for 56 days, uh, four times a day, every four hours. And I set up this bag, like that, that's two liters of fluid that I put into my stomach. Those are, there's 56 caps on the ground for every day that I did it. Um, and then to capture like, like yes, dialysis was a lot and, um, but it wasn't like the end of the world. And that's what I tried to capture here. Um, and in some other spaces, I, I practiced um, aerial dance and burlesque dance. And I made a lot of friends in the community that were photographers. And I, I got really frustrated and upset by how um, desexualizing disability can be. Um, there's a lot of body dysmorphia that happens, a lot of shame, a lot of stigma that doesn't get talked about. And I think this is sexy. And I, I, <laughs> I, I think I would like to see more art representing a large population of the people that exist in this world. You know, people with disabilities make up a quarter of the population, literally one in four. And this is the first picture I've ever seen of somebody with a PD cap and I made it. And I just, I, this picture for me is like a, a call to action for the future, like asking for, for more of this and for a normalization of it. And I also, of course, I feel like I, I can't do any of this without mentioning Chase Nichols, my donor. That's the guy who uh, gave me an organ up and walking around hours after he gave me said organ. And uh, if this picture were in color, you would like, if you saw a picture of me hours, like before, just before the surgery, I looked about this gray. And then I like the, just the, the stark contrast that happens after you have a kidney transplant is so noticeable. Like I became like full color, but I don't know. I just, I really love this picture because it's, it's the day I got a, a new life. And I did a lot immediately with that life. Uh, this is me at the University of Siena. 
um, I traveled to Italy to represent the Alport Syndrome Foundation uh, months after my transplant. It wasn't very long at all. It was the next October, not even a full year after recovery, but um, it was really important to me to share some of what I had learned. Uh, Alport syndrome also causes deafness, like pretty profound, significant in both ears deafness. And none of us get access to sign language. Um, like because of the nature of our deafness, there's a lot of just corrective technology that is used. And in my experience that caused a lot of negative mental health stuff. And so I had the opportunity to go to speak with international experts, uh, nephrologists, and just every kind of specialist related to Alport syndrome. And uh, it was a profound experience. Uh, this, the sign that I'm actually teaching here is the sign for perspective, which I often use as a point making uh, sign to show like you know it's it's one person but in order to have a perspective you have to turn their point of view and look internally and I think that's a lot of what this show is about like this is my introspection projected and expressed through this, through this show and I think that a lot of understanding other people comes from really understanding oneself um which kind of brings me to my next point. Um, I mentioned that I'm a scholar and that's because I contributed greatly to the development and testing of this simplified signs, which is an augmentative uh, alternative communication tool uh, that my late mentor had been working on for 25 years. And I got to help out with, with uh, in, in the last like five years of its production. And after he passed away in 2018, um, I worked closely with the surviving authors and his family to ensure that our work was published. And in 2020, it was. Um, Open Book Publishers published Simplified Science Volumes 1 and 2, which are available for download for free for anyone ever. Uh, you can also buy the handsome hardback copies if you're interested in this research. But um, I really love the concept of what we developed. Um, it ties really, relates really closely to just my spiritual and personal beliefs, um, which tie closely into universal design, which is to say that there are some things that are just so beautifully innately human that we can't really argue against that. And what I've come to believe and understand is that to sign is human. It, there is something innately within us that allows us to connect beyond just a level of communication. There is an intimacy, there is a reverence, there is something uniquely human and profound about sign language. Um, so after, uh, it, this is kind of the transition um, phase to the second part of my show, which is, uh, uh, largely just the work, the body of work that I've created over the course of recovery um, and working with my community. And so I'm just gonna flip through a couple of things that some of you might've seen before. This is a new piece um, that's currently on exhibit. It's called, uh, I just really like the title of this one, which is why I'm sharing with you. It's called, uh, Your House of Cards Has Elephants in Every Room. Um, it kind of shows how I feel about being a person who has to like hide behind stigma in spaces where I don't feel welcome. <laughs> um, this was a connective thing that I got to do last summer with Second Street Gallery at the Roy G. Biv exhibit. This was our setup on Second Street. Um, this beaded crab skull is on display in the gra gallery right now along with some of the paper crabs that I made. Um, this was a call to action that I created because there are a lot of inequities experienced by LGBTQ people in the medical system. Um, to give you an example of personal experience, I recently transitioned and changed my name and became a non-binary person. And I am currently writing letters to senators to join the fight asking to add non-binary as a checkbox for social security cards and Medicare which does not currently exist. Um, and I found out that my birth state, North Dakota, 
does not allow you to change your name on the basis of gender identity. Virginia does. Um, so if you think about what Medicare does, it allows you to have insurance if you're disabled and they get really stingy if paperwork doesn't match and they will deny you insurance coverage, et cetera. And so these are just, that's just one example. <laughs> that's not exactly stigma, that's systemic. Um, but ultimately like not everybody has the energy to fight these systemic battles. Not everybody has the support, not everybody has the financial resources and people die all the time um, from despair, from physical illness. Uh, and I've, I've lost a lot of friends this year, last year um, because of stuff like this. And I don't want it to keep happening. So I share it with my community and I hope that we become more accepting of one another. Um, and that's what this is. I feel like I really found family, um, even virtually, even when I wasn't going out. That's what all these images are. This is Mala Leche. This is my fuck people. This is, you know, Second Street. These are other artists that are afraid, aren't afraid to talk about the things that we don't want to talk about. These are the people who welcome me when I'm confused and transitioning in the process. These are the people who respond. These are the people who stand out, act out. These are uh, kinfolk, as my friend Misha titled one of her murals in town. Um, family is something that has dramatically changed its definition for me recently. And um, a lot of these collages are about me exploring family. They're about me exploring uh, roots to myself. I taught myself how to stitch, which is what some of these little stitchlings, I call them stitchlings because they're so tiny, are. And then I actually spent um, Don't Fade Away is a sweater in a box that uh, another friend artist drew and the, the screen print started to fade. And so I decided to embroider around the lines. Um, and I just, I think that there are things worth preserving. And I, I kind of tried to embody that with the embroidery. Um, there's also been a lot happening in Charlottesville, you know, August 12th and all of the things that have happened since and uh, the moving of the statues and, you can't live here and not feel that tension and that strain and see it all. And I, I, um, I used to walk by this statue every day of Lee, who's on my way to work. And, um, you know, there, I kept seeing different people doing different defacing. And uh, I really felt called when somebody had put 1619 in what looked like black paint with a big handprint on the bottom of the statue and I knew that they were gonna wash it off. So I, I wanted to draw it and spend some time with it and contemplate it and um, what does it mean was really a diary entry. I never meant to share it with anyone until the first calling from Mala Leche and it just felt like an opportune time. Um, but I, I, what I do, when people ask me what I do as an artist is I really just reflect. This is a reflection, it's a diary entry. Um, I also go on a lot of walks and I have a tendency to talk to flowers. This is one of my favorites. My friend came in early in the gallery and uh, took this picture of me next to this giant peony that just brings me infinite joy. Uh, I don't know if you can see it, but I see a Chinese dragon, uh, like sort of facing the side with his tongue sticking out and a big eye. And like, once I see it, I can't unsee it. And it just looks like this flamboyantly pink dragon to me. And I love it. <laughs> and I hope you all love it too. That's why I made it giant. Uh, and one of the other things that really brought me joy throughout this time uh, was spending time making things for others, for other people. People were special to me, like showing them that I wanted to spend time and care for them. And this is a, a print picture of one of my favorite collages. It's multi-textured. It's called uh, Gold Stays in Appalachia. 
I met a 36 year old donkey, which was a donkey that was older than me and I didn't know that they lived that long. He was white and he's a Jerusalem donkey. And I found out that those were the kind of donkeys that carried Jesus around. And I thought that was kind of cool and profound, but they were just on this hillside in the middle of the mountains on this big farm. And it was a magical place to be that I felt very privileged to have been able to visit. And I collected some of the pine needles and there was some goldenrod growing nearby and I picked some of that up. And then I just had all this scrap fabric and I kind of stitch it all together into a little piece and I ended up actually not being able to part with it. And the person that I made it for got a print, but I, I don't feel bad about it because I really, I really truly do love this one. Um, and uh, this is another piece made for a friend. It's called Gemini Sunflowers. Um, um, it just a, a little personal like tidbit. I, I have a lot of an anatomical textbooks and I do a lot of my art making things with those to sort of do sort of teaching art, if you will. And um, this is an EKG of a, a person having an anxiety attack. And um, you know, the friend that I made this for, she and I both share a tendency for high anxiety and we both love talking about stuff like that and looking at it. And I try to incorporate things that are profoundly personal into the pieces that I make. And, you know, they, in my experience, everything that I've made for somebody so far, they've been kind of taken aback by some of that. And it, it makes me happy. Um, and then a big section that I have, uh, this is called While I Go Out Walking, like it's similar to the peony that I described. Um, these are the pictures that I take on my phone when I go out on walk, lots of flowers. But I also take pictures of masks. Um, I think ever since 2020 started, I sort of became mildly like triggered a little bit every time I see a mask on the ground. It just immediately makes me feel neglected a little bit because it makes me think about all of the people who have refused to wear masks or decided that they didn't want to believe that this virus exists and, you know, surviving a global pandemic as a person who is immunocompromised and listening to even the leader of the CDC saying things like it's um, encouraging that only the disabled and elderly are dying from this is hard. And, um, I think when I go on walks for as many beautiful flowers as I see, I also see this harrowing neglect, like a constant sort of reminder, they coexist. Um, and I did a very intentional placing of these, um, there's 40 images and 10 of them are masks. And I did this because it, I wanted to, visually show statistical space. Um, like I said earlier, one in four people are disabled. And I don't see this statistic represented in workspaces, in classrooms, in boardrooms, in tables. I like, I'm, I'd like to, because I really think that when disabled people are included, instead of encouraged to die, uh, the world is a much beautiful, more beautiful place. There are a lot of things that exist because of disabled people that I think a lot of people take for granted. Text messaging, the huddle for football. Um, like this, I could go on and have a whole nother talk about that, but I just, I want to embrace this dichotomy of delights and disparities. Um, and try to encourage more inclusivity. And then uh, I apologize, this is the only real picture that I have of the piece that I was working on, uh, white paper, brown paper, which is a concept that I've just been trying to show visually for a really long time. Um, this is my current work. This is what I've been working to end. This is 
systemic eugenics in real time, friends. Um, this is what our society built. These are my labs. My actual, this is kidney failure in real time, like going from the top to the bottom, from the time that I had healthy kidneys to the time that my kidneys failed. And off to the side, I included um, an email that I wrote, that I wrote to my nephrologist asking to be referred for transplant before he would have referred me himself. And it's that kind of self-advocacy and proactiveness that is required when this sort of stuff happens, which is why the stuff that I'm about to get into happens. Is because if you're not aware, if you're not medically literate, if you're not able to comprehend these tiny mathematical calculations that just get normalized without anybody paying attention, then you're not going to know that you're being discriminated against. Um, what I highlighted in these images were the dates so that you could see time and then a quantity for GFR. GFR stands for glomular filtration rate. It is the standard metric at how our kidney function is measured. Every single time anybody gets any blood work done, you get what's called a basic metabolic panel and it prints out this. This is a basic model metabolic panel printout. It tells you quantities of different things that are in your blood. The number that's important in this calculation for EGFR is the number for creatinine. Creatinine is a waste product produced by your muscles. So how big you are, if you're male or female, ish, like it, how big your muscles are really are, are what contributes to how much creatinine is in your body. And um, if you are a black person and your doctor identifies you as a black person, they can give you the, the African-American GFR, which is a standard GFR times 1.2, which makes that number bigger. And when that number is bigger, it can delay the time that you start dialysis. It can delay the time that you start, you're eligible to refer to transplant. And it can extend the time that you are on the wait list for, to receive a donated kidney. It has a very direct impact um, and it's completely subjective. And the science that it's based on uh, was a study that was conducted in 1999 that if you look closely at the populations, um, it's completely statistically irrelevant. Like it's not valid. They had no business drawing the conclusion of, oh, if a person is black, we should multiply their creatinine uh, or their GFR by 1.2. Um, and so one of the other pieces in my show it, uh, toward the end is a, a printout from the American Society of Nephrology Journals, which is a report from a task force that I joined discussing ending the inclusion of race-based, um, there's a word, I keep forgetting the title of this, it, it, to stop them multiplying it by 1.2 and just using the same standard metric of EGFR for everyone, regardless of race, which they should do because they didn't control for race when they did that study. But um, most people don't know what kidneys do that they filter waste out of your blood like creatinine, much less how that creatinine affects how you're perceived as in terms of how sick you are with kidney disease. Um, and this is what I'm trying to stop from happening with all of my political advocacy and disability stuff. And I am going to keep trying to come up with other ways to make it something really complex, more understandable because this outrages me. And I, I think it would outrage anybody who looks at it. Um, and I think I did a pretty good job at leaving us time for questions. Yay, Maureen. I think that's, that's the end of my show. Oh, wait, I have one more. Um, so I want your art, friends. Um, there is a hallway that I get to go to a lot. Uh, it's in the transplant clinic at the West Complex here in Charlottesville where I had my transplant. And um, there's a lot of people like me who need transplants or had a transplant 
or are about to get a transplant that walk down this hallway. And right now the walls are just sad and beige. Um, and I have permission to help fill some of those spaces. And so if you send me pictures of art, I'm gonna get with some people at UVA transplant clinic and we're gonna pick three pieces to join one of my pieces in the hallway and we can make it pretty and encouraging and inspirational for other patients while they're on their journeys like mine. Yay. I'm gonna switch back to Maureen now and she can field y'all's questions for me. I'm gonna stop my screen share. Thanks, Jess. That was wonderful. If anyone um, has any questions, please uh, drop them in the chat. Um, for Jess, we'll take a few questions. Um, take a moment to think, think through questions you might have, especially if you've seen the exhibit and you have any questions about work you saw in the show. Um, if anyone in the gallery has questions, uh, feel free to unmute the, um, the um, unmute yourselves and just ask if it's easier than typing in the chat. Hi, Jess. Thanks so much for sharing your full expression. It's so great to see it all up on the wall. Um, my question is not about your art, though. My question is, if we want to limit the disparity, what are one or two concrete actions that individuals can take to make a more supporting community for everybody? Um, my biggest thing right now is closed captions on everything, um, your social media posts, your Instagram stuff. Um, the closed captions help more than just deaf people. There's a lot of um, second language learners, that the people who don't know English is their first language. Uh, subtitles help them. Subtitles help people with processing uh, disorders and developmental de delays. There's a lot of neurodivergent people who really truly benefit with subtitles. Um, I think just having them available is sort of a statement of inclusion. Um, ditto for uh, image descriptions. Uh, those sort of things are really helpful. Like if you're posting something, just put a quick in the comments and then an alt text is an option on Instagram too. Like um, these are sort of, and also uh, in, in the way that we've kind of embraced pronouns, like should we just include pronouns? It's sort of a flag letting LGBTQ people know like, oh, okay, these, these people are will, will welcome my change of pronouns if it, if there's something you know different. Um, I think the same is true when like when I see closed captions, when I see image descriptions, I'm like, oh, you know, that person or that organization, like they they care to make this space inclusive, like at least people can participate. Um, that's just kind of phase one. Um, like captions and image descriptions help a lot. I have a question. Hey Jess, um, thank you so much that there's just so much there. I'm gonna be enjoying metabolizing that for a long time. Um, I was wondering, like, it seems like so much of your work is, um, is about a kind of absence and presence. And there are places where you have seem to have noticed an absence of something where you it would be better to have a presence of something and you've kind of um you're doing a lot of kind of transforming and demonstrating that that kind of transformation is possible to others i'm wondering like where do you where where did you get that <laughs> but you know that's kind of <laughs> um we all have that possibility right but but you're you seem more um kind of fluent in exercising that um, so yeah, any response you have, I appreciate. Um, I'm gonna have to thank my neurodivergence for that. 
I I wish like I wish I didn't have to say this, but the answer is it's a survival mechanism. Uh, I refer to myself as something of a social chameleon. Um, and I've just, I've had to be that way. Um, it, it wasn't something that I even noticed I was doing until two years ago when I was diagnosed uh, with, with autism, among other things. Um, but I, I know when I'm not safe and I know what might make me feel safe in, in sort of the same space. And so I think, in a lot of my art, I try, like, if it's a space where I feel like that absence of of safety, of nurturing, of of what what have you, like whatever's lacking, I try to put that in. Um, I I really do try to play with this this balance. Like I've been trying. My mantra is there's space for that, because um, in an infinite universe, like there even these things that seem completely contradictory, uh, they can coexist in infinite space. There is space for that. And so I think in myself and in my art, I try to create whatever space needs to accommodate whatever is. I hope that's a good answer. <laughs> We have a gallery question. Hey Jeff, um, I just want, can you hear me? It's, it, it's such a COVID experience screaming into a computer screen. <laughs> um, but um, I'm a family physician in town and I just wanted to say that as a, like a, there was one of the lab, lab companies that I use, LabCorp, it's a national, you know, lab company. They are removing the GFR for African Americans as of it was actually like at the end of February. So thank you, Jeff, for your work. It's working. <laughs> um, and my question is, what's the future of your art? Like, what's next? Um. Well, I think what's next is what I had to leave out of this show. Um. So I actually had to cut the show in half twice because I'm only out a month. Um, and I have a lot of poetry and a lot of pictures. And there happen to be a lot of opportunities in town right now for like incubator programs and residency programs. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna put my feelers out. Um, I'm also still working on this documentary. I'm trying very hard to finish it. And that requires finding a fiscal sponsor and uh, shooting the last bit of it and coordinating with my donor who just had a baby um, to just put it together. Um, yeah, there's so there's some writing stuff that I hope to make happen. Um, I want to keep making collages. I'm really enjoying this embroidery play. I kind of want to start making some of my own clothes and maybe I, I, I enjoyed stitching over stuff that already existed and so I might try to sell some stuff that's like gently embroidered to be dimensional or textured. Um, I don't know, I'm kind of going wherever the wind blows me. Uh, I'm excited for new opportunities. <laughs> Aaron, did I see your hand? Do you want to ask a question? No, I was clapping. I'm just enjoying. <laughs> I have a quick and quirky question. Jess, um, since you got to stock your pantry for the, <laughs> this period of time, if you don't mind sharing, what did you choose to have in your pantry as the fellow? Yeah, that's everybody's favorite question. It's so funny. Uh, I answered that in the interview uh, that New City Arts has online, but um, I, I, I really love potato chips, especially post-transplant. Um, potato chips were some, potatoes in general were a thing I was not allowed to eat for, damn near a year and it made me sad. Um, and uh, I really love the Chesapeake Bay crab flavor where they put like Old Bay essentially on potato chips. They're my fave. Uh, and boiling black cherry soda um, is another thing that I also only eat sparingly because they're not, not these are not kidney friendly snacks. I don't recommend them if you're a chronic kidney patient, but they are things that I do enjoy from time to time. I also stocked with um, avocados and clementines 
And I think I ate all the kind bars. That's definitely what I ate the most of. Granola bars are my lifeblood when I forget to eat breakfast. Okay, another question from the gallery. Yay. Um, can you speak to some of your uh, like philosophy and practice behind your collages? Because um, there's like somebody asked about like um, like like your noticing of the absence and presence of social factors and like maybe cutting up like collages like this like really has this aspect of like cutting up reality and and like creating new meanings and I wonder how like these two like practices of yours collage and also like social like trying to, to like hack society like how those may relate and like creating these like um, aesthetic realities I really love this question thank you um so I, I don't know how to even approach, like I feel the answer before I can speak the answer. I talk to books, like pictures talk to me. I think in pictures. And when I meet people, I see pictures sort of around them. And there are certain images that over time I have come to associate with a lot of symbology. You know, I, I do a lot of reading of, specifically Jungian psychology. I got really into it in my early college days and kind of went on tangents of studying tarot and astrology and the, you know these old things that we've found like have commonalities. Like I'm really prone to picking up patterns and things. And so I just sort of have this endless spider web of connectivity between things, right? And so if I'm going to make a collage like just for myself it often starts with a, a feeling or an idea but that feeling or idea is already something of a picture to me um the one that's coming to mind right now is hope chokes which I don't have a picture of but is in the gallery um I saw a plastic bag blowing uh, and it, it's just like a it was floating and I thought it was kind of elegant, but also choking the landscape. Like, <laughs> and it, it made me just think of what it felt like to have constraint, even when you're like trying. Cause I think I had recently read about like a new initiative to try to like clean up the streets or something like that. And it just struck me as ironic in the moment. Um, but I think I just, I start flipping through pages of books that I have. I have a lot of books that had animals in them. I have a lot of uh, like old National Geographics and old life magazines and um, a lot of anatomical books, like I said. And there's just, I follow the thread of what pulls me. And I think I do the same thing socially, following the thread of what pulls me and that, that sort of social chameleonness that I use as something of a default. Um, I, I, I go where I'm called. I, 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 I feel it out and it, it sort of comes to me. I feel more conduit than act, active action or maker doer. It's more like I'm flipping through the book and the image is like, I'm right here. <laughs> And I'm the one that goes here. Um, yeah, and it's what whatever's missing or whatever belongs with that thing. Sometimes I'll go hunting for a very specific thing. Like I needed a lotus flower in an image. And so I tore through my whole bookcase until I found one. The I went hunting for elephants. Like, but like, for the for the elephant one, I was I I knew I needed like six different elephants, and so I I tore through my whole bookshelf looking for elephants. And so sometimes it's like that, and other times I'll just be flipping through a book, and there will be an image in it, and it'll be like, ooh, that needs to be in something. Jess, should we take one more question and then conclude? Yeah, that sounds good. Great. 
Anyone have any other questions, including Letty, if you have a question, you're welcome to ask. <laughs> okay, one more from here. I get to go twice, lucky me. <laughs> um, Jess, you've talked a lot about um, the different languages that your mind speaks and the way that you kind of speak to different communities or things like books. And here in the studio, I can see a lot of visual languages. And so I'm curious if you found that certain forms of creativity uh, are conducive to a particular expression of thought, or um, if there are certain messages that come through in one language versus another. Does that question make sense? Um, actually, yes. Um, I. So in the process of doing the development of the simplified signs, my uh, supervisor and I examined um, over a hundred dictionaries of signed languages from all over the world. Uh, we were looking at patterns of iconicity, which is like how closely a sign resembles um, the thing that it describes. So like hammer is a very iconic sign. Um, and, uh, so in that process, I was actually in the process of learning ASL, American Sign Language, which is distinct from other signed languages. And, um, you know, like I said in the video, they, they do get mixed in my brain. They get mixed in my brain with the simplified signs. They get mixed in my brain with other gestures that I have studied. Um, and I also had, was very fortunate to spend some time abroad. Um, I did a semester at sea during my time at UVA in the summer of 2013, and I just always picked up languages quickly, and I find that when I'm immersed in an environment, I will just start speaking that language. Um, it, not fluently, not well, but if I need to get to the bathroom, if I need food, it, like I, I can get around. If you put me in the middle of any country, I'm pretty confident I can get myself out of it if I need to. Um, I, so I've, I've studied some, I, I think I'm most fluent in Spanish, um, but I, I also spent a lot of time working in kitchens um, and there's a pretty high Hispanic population of people working in kitchens. I've also been to Spain and Mexico. Um, and so my, my Spanish is probably my best non-English spoken language, but I, I also picked up on some German, some Italian um, and, I, I really enjoy looking at um, Arabic and um, how, like glyph languages, like cal calligraphic stuff, because I find shapes in it that resemble gesture. Um, and I'm really intrigued at delving more into that at some point, looking at the symbolism and calligraphy of other world languages. Um, I think there are many times where messages for collages or our poetry happens in sign language in my brain and then I have to sort of like translate it into written English. Um, one of the pieces that's actually on display in the gallery right now I incorporated both sign and written into there's uh, somebody fingerspelling in the background of um, unbabbling occurs in dreams and what's being fingerspelled fits in with the written words. Um, so it's it's always a jumble for me, like all of these languages are sort of ever present, um, but the pieces and some of them are in English, some of them are in ASL, some of them are a jumble. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think uh, we'll conclude uh, today's talk and Thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you for coming, Jess. Thank you so much for sharing with us today, sharing your work with um, our community, both in the gallery as well as virtually today. Um, thank you, Letty, for interpreting. We'll make this recording available on our YouTube page. Um, and we hope to see you in the gallery um, this spring for upcoming fellowship exhibitions. Um, the next one will be uh, during First Fridays in April. Um, okay, great. Thank you all for coming.